Hallelujah. Greet everybody that's not here. I just, I'm sad that you're not here because I, there's so much family out there that's watching, um, and I just love you so much. And I wish I could give you a great big hug this morning. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter eight for just a few moments. Let me exhort you. I'm going to just read these this whole chapter. Uh, this is not the sermon, it's just an exhortation leading up to something. So we're going to find out one verse in here to let us know that this, you know, all Old Testament is, is relevant. It's pertinent to the new, but it's a shadow. And so Jesus actually validates this chapter because he uses one of the verses out of it in his talking or speaking against Satan in the wilderness in temptation. So... I only say that to say this, Old Testament scripture is very relevant. And so you can take it, uh, don't throw it out, don't say, well, that's Old, Old Testament. We can't go along with that. But let's look at verse 1, it's, and uh, this, is, um, this is just before um, the uh, Israelites go in to, to possess the promised land. And so God is about, he's about to launch them in. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So the next, the next book is Joshua. So um, he's getting ready to, to engage in, the, in a new era of time. And so what we see here is God's commandments and the way that God is dealing with the Israelites. But there's something here for us. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knowest not, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee known that the man, that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And that's the one that Jesus quoted to Satan. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. In other words, God kept their clothing, and all their shoes did not wear out. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a land good, and a land of brooks, of waters, of fountains, of depths, of that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, and land of olive oil and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of it whose hills thou mayest dig brass. So he's talking about that they would be able to forge these things out uh, for artifact and, and, and build you know, weaponry and anything that they needed for the future. Um, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds, thy flocks multiply, thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from house, a house of bondage, the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were, were fiery serpents, scorpions, drought, and there was no water, who brought thee uh, forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that thou, and that, and that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and my might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. 
But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that hath given thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do, if if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. All the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your faith, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. So we read that whole chapter, but the main verse there leading up to that, which was hard to do anything but read it all to lead up to that, is uh, the one that I wanted you to see is the verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sweareth unto thy fathers as it is this day. Okay, Old Testament principle also transfers over into the New Testament. The one and main reason, now he loves you. We know this, Our, you know, we're not here today to teach um, uh, pound and provision and all the different truths of uh, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. And Jesus lists all those things. Why, you be like the, why would you be like the Gentiles? So there's an established truth in this house and to those that are watching um, that your heavenly father is your provider and provides for your clothing, your food, your raiment, the necessities of life because of your DNA. In other words, because you're his child, um, there is a DNA or a family exchange as a promise that you will always have just on the sim simplicity of you're a son or daughter. Then there is also an understanding here that transfers over into the New Testament. It's it's, uh, we don't, we're not going to go there, but the transfer of this over into the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 12, 28. There's an entire office in the eight offices that is entirely devoted to the transition or the transfer of money. And the transfer of money primarily goes back to this particular uh, essence of truth that the Lord says the number one reason outside of just making sure you're okay as a son or daughter the number one reason why I will increase you with great wealth is not so you can, uh, it, it's for your prosperity. Now you get to enjoy the dividends, but it's like the number one, it's just right here in front of us, and we understand this. The number one reason why he'll get wealth over to you is so that you can help establish his covenant in the earth. Could we say the number one reason why he would get wealth over to you is so that you can help fund a revival? I mean, that, that's not taking it out of context. That's establishing his covenant. We're, we're teaching his New Testament covenant to the nations. It's our number one, uh, it's our prerogative, it's, our, it's our, our desire like nothing else is to go in with a straightforward motion to teach in doctrine and in demonstration what the gospel looks like in the earth. That's his covenant. And so when you get behind that and you support it with an essence of, because there's a lot of people that are watching and there's men and women in here that have said in their hearts in days gone by, I believe that God, and some of you have received prophecies, that God wants to uh, increase you and make you wealthy. I pray that a lot of you become very, very rich, but you, your riches will not increase you may, you may increase your riches, but your, in, your riches will not increase and you won't get rich from the Lord unless your desire, your prerogative is so that your wealth can be able to fund the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is your desire, then as a steward, he's like over here, you know, we taught that whole lesson and it was like five weeks long. Now he'll take care of you over here. Yep, child son, daughter, take care of you. Oh, you're, you want to get in the flow of increase where increase comes and increase comes and it multiplies and great wealth comes and I can trust you to, to put that back into the ministry. In other words, you won't be like, oh, this is the year for, oh, thank God. You know, we made a bunch, but this is the year for R&R. &R. We just need to, man, sit on a, sit on a beach someplace or someplace and just watch the sunset. Just enjoy life. Now, that's not, that's not making it for him. Making it for him is, 
Lord, run it through me, but it'll come through me and it'll go out. It will go out. It won't, I won't have sticky fingers. Sticky fingers are not what he's talking about here. It's the ones that say, Lord, increase my wealth. Tell me how blessed you want me to be out of that wealth. But his number one desire is so that he can increase you and hopefully trust you to let it flow through you. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? I hope it does because it's the word of God. And uh, so praise the Lord. Everybody say amen. 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 Say amen or owl, either one. It doesn't matter. Praise the Lord. Father, we worship you. We thank you on this new year that there are people in this house and there are people that are watching who, Lord, will not forget their charge that you've given them to increase things for the kingdom of God. We bless you. We thank you that we take, it's like worship, it, we take great privilege in knowing that, Lord, you will increase us. Lord, there's no virtue in poverty. Paul had nothing at the end of his life, but he had this that he said with godliness, godliness with contentment was great gain. But Lord, that you were calling him into nations and places to where that he would sacrifice himself for the purpose of the gospel. But you also had people back at Philippi and different men and women that were being, even in hard times, were being made rich, that they could fund him on the missionary field. So, Lord, wherever we're at in life and wherever you've called us to, we're filled with prosperity. So I pray that there will be men and women in this house and people that are watching that will become very rich in the days ahead. But I pray that even from the very beginning that they will set their compass Lord, not to wait until they have a lot in the bank to begin to release it, but that, Lord, that they will begin to release that wealth as it is made. And, Father, I pray that your grace will be upon this house and in other houses and in other ministries that are believing you for an outpouring of power, but there will also be an outpouring of your grace through riches. And, Lord, we give you all the praise and glory, and we thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. As you're preparing that, and I hope you are preparing something this morning, and I hope you're preparing something if you're watching. Let me give you a few announcements. Uh, the giving statements are in the back. They're first Sunday. We're real proud of Miss Candy. I, th I thank God um, for her diligence. And so all the giving statements have also been sent out. Uh, if you're missing one or um, you don't see your, your name, contact candy she'll help you out um, but please stop by there pick it up today um, we'll only wait a couple of weeks and then we'll just mail them out so please pick out yours and um, so we appreciate it and we appreciate all the giving in 2019 amen let me could you hand me that cell phone I was meant to make a couple announcements while people are making out those huge checks hallelujah yeah amen who said that I said it Somebody said it with me. That was good. Um, Pastor Jim Martin and Kathy are coming next month. Isn't that going to be great? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to say that again. Isn't that going to be great? Yeah. Hallelujah. Because he listens to all these services. Okay. We'll, we'll debit. We'll, uh, not debit. We'll cut. Dub. We'll dub the, the, the part where everybody was melancholy. Um, I'm just going to say to you, oh, this is, hey guys, Pastor Jim and uh, Miss Kathy are coming next month. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Ooh, that's, it's going to be good. Uh, let me see if I can get. Okay, so he contacted me. I'm not going to try to find his email, but he said starting last April that the Lord began to speak to him about what to teach here when he came in February. That's amazing. And he, so he's been putting it together, and he said he has not studied this under anyone else's like ministry, and he's never taught this consecutively in a series, not even at his church. So we're going to get something brand new. But he's going to be here um, starting Wednesday, 
February the 12th. So Candy and I are going to pick them up Wednesday, but I said, you need to preach that night. So he's going to start that night, and then we'll pick back up on Sunday, February the 16th, going through Wednesday, um, February the 19th. Okay, so there are going to be like six services. Okay, so he sent this out, and we're going to post this on the, we've posted it on Facebook, and we're going to post it back on the bulletin board. But the caption is, um, and, and quotes is what shall be it's quoting from Matthew chapter 24 what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world what does the Bible really say about the Antichrist the false prophet the beast the mark of the beast the rapture Jim Martin will be teaching this special end time prophecy seminar okay and it'll be right here and he's never taught it before so you're going to get some good info. Hallelujah. And I like it that he's not gotten it from some other source. Okay, some, some of those guys that, mm, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this is going to be really, really good. We're going to have a, um, you know, you can get people, <laughs> you, can, you can get people to church uh, to listen to end time prophecy when you can't get them. Now, if you tell your friend, hey, come to our church and we're going to teach you how to, um, die to your flesh and cut back on a lot of stuff and and give yourself over to the Lord and fast a lot in this pr in this year and do a lot of stuff you, you're gonna get like zilch <laughs> you know it's gonna get it's like a, but you can tell people hey we're gonna talk about the Antichrist oh would you like to know who oh yeah man yeah I want to know who the Antichrist is you know they, they won't be able to raise you know anybody from dead or anything but they're they want to know who the Antichrist is so go ahead and ask your friends you know would you like to know and maybe Maybe because Jim walks in the same, you know, uh, heart that we do for, towards revival. So right in the middle of that, maybe God will put a hook in their jaw, you know, because God, I tell you what, something about God, God's sneaky. I had to tell you that he's really sneaky in a good way. OK, he really is. I, I though, of all the five ministries that's listed in Ephesians 4, 11, I did the one that I did not coming out of Bible college. I did not want to be a pastor. I did not want to be a pastor. And when I came down here the first time, I said, I, you know, I thought, oh, Lord, I don't. When they invited me, I did not want to be a pastor, and I did not want to be a pastor in a mockley, okay? <laughs> but he's so sneaky because the church that I was going to, the pastor there, because the, the cell group ministry had like 20 or 30, you know, it was like maybe close to 30 cell groups. And uh, so the cell groups were way bigger, a lot more people than we've got as a church. So Candy and I would travel around each week to a cell group, and we were like pastors over that. And so the guy told me, he goes, would because they were looking for somebody to lead the Bible study. He goes, do go down there for a little while, if you don't mind, and then I'll, you know, I'll bring you back out of there. And uh, so we stayed, <laughs> we stayed down here for like three or four months, and Miss Barbara prayed us in. And then uh, we, we just kept, we just kept uh, staying here, and then after a while, I was like, Oh, God, I can't leave. I can't leave. And then I got the commission for the revival. And so it's like, God, this, that wasn't fair, God. You pull that on me. You know, you pull that on me. I was like, I'll, you know, I don't want to be. So hallelujah. Amen. So pick up your giving reports today. Let's all stand together. I want to thank everyone for your giving. And uh, I know that, you know, some services are not uh, convenient for you to do so. And then other services, you're just bless a, a bunch and I really appreciate it whatever it is so thank you very much and everyone that's giving online thank you so much I wish we could get all of our family together in a big place sometime that'd be really cool right I want us to pray uh, real quick for Australia we have one of our we have some people down there that watch and we have a sister maybe she's watching uh, Katrina, she might be watching this morning. She watches almost every service. She blesses the church with her giving. And uh, they are having an incredible, I'm talking about the, the whole continent like is on fire. All the perimeter and it's just burning and it's just thousands of people, thousands of people and homes are being destroyed. It's like unbelievable. I was, she was a couple of weeks ago asking us to pray. I prayed and then uh, I saw some more on, it, on the news. So let's just pray. Let's just believe God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're the God that sends the rain and puts out fires. Now we speak, just like we would concerning something of uh, physical infirmity. We speak to the rain. Lord, you have not stopped doing what you did for Elijah 
in the name of Jesus, I command the rain to come. And I command the fires to be put out. And I command that in the name of Jesus, just like the hurricanes that, Lord, we stand against here, for the Christians who will stand, that there will be no loss of home or property or lives in the name of Jesus, that you'll place your, your hedge about them. And in the name of Jesus and fires, we command you in Jesus' name to be put out by the power of God in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sunday night, next Sunday night, the 12th, um, we will start back on our prayer services. And I say our prayer services because we've done a lot of things in the past year that were really wonderful, had a lot of teaching. And we will have, uh, Miss Gay will continue at times because confession is a very vital part of our church and is a very vital part of our life. It's part of our spiritual warfare. Um, so, but it really is going to be um, a prayer night. A prayer night. So uh, Sunday night's going to be a prayer night slash confession. So find your corner. Find your, get, get camped out. It's all right to bring stuff. Uh, if we grease up the walls, we'll, <laughs> we'll have some of you guys that painted it one time, paint it again in a year from now. It's okay, but find a place of prayer. Camp out. Get rooted. Get rooted. Uh, somebody said, well, I can pray at home. Well, he's asked us to pray together, too. Hallelujah. It's just like uh, the blueprint for 2020. Uh, I really appreciate, because I've had different elders come up already and say, man, I'm listening to this. Uh, what, I'm just asking you to do it. If for no other reason, as pastor, I don't really know, I blah, blah, you know, what. I'm asking you to do it as your pastor. Would you do it, please? Would you, would you at least, at least 30 times listen to that? Because I can tell you it has in it, God, uh, I'm not going to go rehearse. I, I taught one time on it. Um, when was it? Uh, New Year's Eve, okay? Sent out a letter on it. And maybe more needs to be, and I'll talk more about it in just a little bit. But there is a series of eight different prophecies that the Lord has given us going into 2020. And I believe that it's very, very strategic. Man, I heard some things in there. Um, I was listening to it, was it yesterday? I, you know, I'm doing it, I'm like on the treadmill listening to it. So you can, you know, if you, if you don't run too fast or walk too fast, you can, you can still listen. You can do a whole lot of different things and get it accomplished. But I was like right in the middle of it and um, people that are in spiritual warfare need to hear it. My God, it had some, some instruction concerning spiritual warfare and, uh, and forgiving one another and just, it had some instruction about forgiving yourself, letting different things go. And I'm telling you, the Lord has got us on his mind. He believes that we're gonna receive this thing. But not only does he believe it, but Satan also believes it too. So I want to begin. I don't know really where we're going to go this morning. I kind of have notes in front of me, but I'm just listening as I go because I really want to, I want this to be prophetic. I think we're going to have a lot of prophetic services in the, in the next year. Father, I'm asking you, and I'm not doing this as uh, someone that is standing apart but uh, I know that there are, there are elders in this house, men and women. There are those that are becoming in leadership by their own self-qualification to take this message and allow it to be perfected in their life. And so, Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus, the Lord, that you will stir the hearts. And I believe that you're already stirring the hearts. But I pray that the things that we will hear in these hours, in the days ahead, Lord, will, it's not, it won't be a church service, but it'll be instructions of grace in guiding us in going forward, Lord, as a body, as a body that will receive this outpouring, as a body, Lord, that will receive visions and dreams. Lord, I just know because you've, you have spoke to me concerning different things, that this is going to be a year of visions dreams, supernatural manifestations like we've never seen before. 
Sometimes we're going to think it's strange. It'll all be measured under doctrine. And everything will be measured by the word. But Father, I thank you that there will be and there is in this house a supernatural breathing by your presence in the name of Jesus. Lord, one of the prophecies I remember present tense as I pray is for us to remember our significance. Lord, I just pray that our significance will come to a place where we begin to believe more and expect more from ourselves than, than ever before. And that, Lord, even though that we will not be a people of self-induced pride, but yet, Lord, that we will not be those who are given over to a false humility that says, I'm not worthy to think of myself that way. But, Lord, I pray that we will think of ourselves as an elite special forces group that have been called and asked to separate our life that can do only what no other group can do that is not following this format. And that is to follow your word, to go into your word and to go into your presence and to go into fastings and prayers and the rehearsal of your word among us, all speaking the same thing one with another. And Father, I thank you that through it, that Lord, that you're going to receive from us the authority necessary to pour this outpouring on the church. And then as it tsunamis into this region, as it touches the hearts, we don't care, Lord, if churches, uh, Lord, have a great dividends and an overflow of these things where people are coming into churches as a result of the light that will come to this city. That is our joy. But Lord, we know that this place is an epicenter. It would be false humility on my part to say, Lord, well, there's many others just like us in this region. There's many others in this city like us in this, like us in this city. Lord, we do not stand in a place of condemnation, condescending. But Lord, we just simply, in, in, in your humility, say, Lord, we know that there is few just like us and we cannot go the way of the church we cannot go the way of programs and things that will there is given to us a straight out of heaven commission to go into prayer to go into fasting to lose our life for the purpose of what the world and the church has not seen and that is a great spiritual outpouring with signs and wonders now we receive our commission. We ask you, Lord, daily to help us. Help us even now, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I hope you're carrying around your articles of war. Well, one is this. The other one, I wish I'd have brought my 2020 um, uh, at a glance calendar. I know you can put them on your smart devices. That's fine. But where, what, what, what present tense are your black, blackout days? You know, where are you already presently planning to, okay, I'm going to fast those five days, skip that, okay, I'm going to fast though, and there's, listen, and I'm not saying it, now this could sound condescending, I'm not saying it as in judgment, like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this, but I can tell you this, anything that you can do, Kenneth Hagin used to say that if you could just eat less, it's an execution against, because what we've studied for, you know, uh, all, all the 66 books, what we do know is this, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, I can just prove it by the Word of God, is that fasting, you can't fast TV, you can't fast the mall, you can't fast your greatest hobby or this, that, and the other. That's called abstinence, and sometimes they'll ask you to do an abstinence, you know, hold off on that. You know, uh, social media may be an abstinence that he asks you to do while you're fasting. But fasting is always, both Old, New, Old and New Testament, word of God uh, is going without food. It's just going without food. So even if you can, uh, if you can, you know, sometimes people are on medication and they seriously can't take off, a, you know, a full day. Can you go a meal or two? Can you go without certain... Uh, uh, Daniel, I think, called it dainties, or the Proverbs calls it dainties, but D uh, Daniel called it, what was the, he, he was on a Daniel's fast, but it was uh, like fruits and vegetables and stuff. Can you, what about abstaining from certain foods that you eat all, all the time? You know, honestly, for me not to have meat, if I'm going to eat food, because, uh, you know, salads is not a, that's not a meal. That's, you know, that's salads is not a meal. 
And unless you have meat there, you know, uh, you haven't, you know, like, you, you haven't had a meal. So, you know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm getting some preach. So, um, so can you go without that? You know, just something because it all has to do with food. I'm going to read this. I believe that you will testify in your heart. Because Gary sent me this early this morning. or uh, It wasn't. Yep, no, it was late last night, I guess. But he had uh, called me yesterday. And some of you are aware of this because you follow Facebook uh, and, uh, and get different news from the other churches. So he sent me this, and he entitled it. And I asked him uh, later through a text, can I read it? He said, sure. The gauntlet has been thrown down, is what he entitled this. At the prayer center... And at churches around the world who have the same vision for supernatural revival, we have been encouraging the people for months to press into prayer and fasting more than ever before in their lives. We have called it passing through the wall of fire, completing the purging process, and so forth. The purpose is to purge any remaining strongholds of the flesh from us so that the Holy Spirit is freely able to minister the life of Christ through us. It seems that we have been taken seriously by the forces of darkness in this region, and I would say in our region as well. Pastor Dave always warned us that whenever any group or people, any group or people got serious about praying and fasting, the rulers of darkness over their region would take notice and they would be targeted for destruction. No penetration of light are to be permitted. On January 3rd, 2020, one of our church members drove himself to the hospital at 3.30 a.m. because he was experiencing symptoms which made him think he was about to have a heart attack. Sure enough, by 4.30 a.m., he was having a full-blown heart attack. Family began notifying the church, and very soon many people were praying for him. He was pronounced dead at noon the following day. A mighty warfare had been going on. Several intercessors prayed without ceasing straight through. He went code blue and recovered 13 times, but the stress on his heart became too much, and he eventually went on to be with the Lord. This happened before we have had even the very first service of the new year at the church. This is no coincidence. Our, um, our challenge, coincidence I meant, our challenge for revival has been heard in the spirit realm and it is as if the enemy has thrown down the gauntlet saying, do you think you will have revival? I will show you how much power I have. I will kill one of your members, and there isn't anything that you can do to stop me. Just like a wolf pack singles out a single sheep from the flock and then attacks, this member was attacked so suddenly and so severely that from the moment of the first symptom until, the, until, the death, until death was only about 32 hours. The member selected for the destruction was not random either. This member was the greeter at the front door of the church. He would greet every single person who entered the church, uh, uh, who entered the church and shake their hand or give them a hug. Everybody knows him and everybody will miss him, seeing him in the future. It will be like a visual reminder at every service of what the enemy was able to do. This is war. We have not, or we have lost a battle. We will win the war. We, we will have revival in the name of Jesus, and darkness will not prevail. Now, I know this person, and uh, I can testify because I've known him for years. Uh, he didn't have sin in his life. That wasn't what took him out. And uh, he's a very wonderful person. Very wonderful person. 
And all of uh, the leadership of uh, the uh, worship team, when I asked, uh, did they know him? And yeah, yeah, we know him for sure. And a uh, wonderful man, 53 years old, and uh, excellent looking health. Very slim looking, kind of uh, had his, phys his body together and everything. So I read that to say this. Uh, that it's not to put fear in people but it is for those that are on this because see we don't gather here I really appreciate anybody that comes and anybody that watches um, but our number one objective is to train warriors that will proceed into revival and we will teach them, systematically as we are teaching them, how to do that um, without fear. Based on what we just read from Gary, that, let me just reiterate a couple things, the gauntlet has been thrown down, and you heard him say in that, that before the first service of the new year, and this is our first service, that's their first service, the enemy come. Because the heart cry of what they're saying is the same thing as what we're saying on any given Sunday. Immokalee's in revival, Tulsa's in revival. And Satan was like, uh, well, if there wasn't kids here, I'd probably use more explicit terms because that's how angry I am. Even if you thought I was sinning, it would just be a depiction of how angry I am in the spirit because of what has happened. But I can tell you this, um, like Gary cited here, that the enemy is taking us serious. He's taking us very serious. So just like Dave used to say, uh, he even quoted there, they would always warn us that whenever a group or people got serious about praying and fasting, the rulers of darkness over their area would take notice and they would target and they would be targeted for destruction they could not allow in essence no penetrations of light are to be permitted what is our inoculation against fear pastor going into God what is our not see here's the bottom line and this is not this is not a uh, see I didn't know where I was going but I do know present tense the bottom line is this uh, however many people were praying um, and they were sincere I even got a chance to pray although for for whatever reason God knows I did not even equate it to this person I'm not naming him this morning it's okay but uh, his family you know I don't think any of them are watching but um, Gary said he's gonna read the same thing in time to come but it's they're hurting there. But all the people that were praying there and the intercessors that was there and even myself, and I did not, when I got the call, I did not, Candy was in the next room and she was trying to put the babies to bed. We had some staying. So she actually texted me and said that she'd gotten this request. Well, I, I was in the front room and uh, I got the text and I was doing something real spiritual with Joe. We were watching Avengers Endgame for the 99th time. So we, we know that we're an Avenger. So I said, what is this? So I paused it and I said, I explained to him, Joe Papa's got to pray for this man. I don't know. So I prayed and I believe God. We, started, we finished the movie. So he dies the next day. So here's the bottom line. It's, they asked Smith Wigglesworth, that man that had uh, been, he'd had so many miracles, and he raised, I think, 11 or 12 uh, documented uh, people raised from the dead. They asked him, now, how does it work? How did you ever get to where that you can have done these things? And he said, well, it's, it's one thing. It's this. It's the blade, the ear, and the full corn of the ear, the full corn in the ear. In other words, it's the 30, that same chapter Jesus taught this. It's 30, the 60, the 100 fold. In other words, it's going from a place of wherever you're at. And Dave says, getting past all of hell, that whatever he can throw at you. 
It's growing up into 60. It's growing up into 70. It's growing up into 80. It's growing up into 90. It's growing up into 100-fold. Because 100-fold is really where he wants all of us to be at. And that's very well po- Jesus said the works that you do, or the works that I do, you'll do also and greater because I go to the Father. Now here's the bottom line, and it's not meant to be condescending because I have to include myself in on it. It's just a, a relevance to where we're at. Um, when I, let's, let's talk personal for a moment. When I teach you through God's word, Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24, and, 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 and teach again and again that Jesus said, see, because this is one of our, uh, this is one of our strategic points of going into war is the article of confession. Jesus said, whosoever shall say into this mountain, and it meant to anything, your, your finances are, are terrible, your body's broke down, Whatever, your depression, you're, 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 you're on the edge of killing yourself all the time, but you turn one day and you say, okay, uh, Jesus said, based on the word of God, whosoever shall say into this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he saith shall come to pass. The word saith there is the word to set in discourse. In other words, it has in its Greek meaning, mean, meaning to say it more than once to set it in discourse and say it repetitively. Well, somebody said, well, I don't, it's not going to work unless you mean it in your heart. I know when it transitions from the soul to the hearts, when it works, but you can't get there unless you do the obedience part of it. Nobody, nobody believes it when they start out. That's why you say it. Nobody believes it. I remember the day, I don't know the day, but when Amber, my daughter, was going through such problems with a childhood disease and it promised to follow her the rest of her life and I'd walk and I would walk and I would confess uh, for hours sometimes the Word of God over her body now her mom was doing the same thing but I'm talking about myself personally I can only speak from my experience and uh, other people were probably praying too but there came there came a day like you know when you step through a door like if I was to walk through that door I'm not trying to be I can only tell you a spiritual experience but I believe it can be backed up by the Word of God. I walked through a door after several months of confessing the Word that it just felt, all of a sudden, it felt absolutely, entirely different. My confession was no longer out of the soul. It was totally out of the heart. And when it came out of the heart, it was done to me. It actually, honest to God, on, it was like one particular day, it was like something came I stepped in another room. Now, when that other room, when you step into that other room, then you've transitioned from the soul to the heart, and I can tell you, it, it comes to pass. Her life was changed, and she's, doing, she's done wonderful for years. She was healed of that particular disease. You can do that and stand. That, that's called confession and speaking to the mountain. That's more than a positive confession. That's more than a positive answer. When somebody says, uh, how you doing? And you say, oh, I'm doing great. That's wonderful. I'm doing, I'm healed. I'm a mighty man of God. I'm a mighty woman of God. That's wonderful. But that's totally different than speaking to the mountain. The woman came up to uh, Smith or to uh, Norval Hayes, and he was a great man of faith that taught the body, right along with Kenneth Hagin and some of those that were apostles of faith. And they asked him, they came up crying, whining, but I'm going to say it nice, because especially when people are hurting. But it was very, accu- it was kind of very uh, accusing. And she said, uh, well, you know, because he had taught on faith. And she said, well, Brother Norval, why, you just taught all this on faith. Why did God let my husband die of cancer? Why did he let him die of cancer? Because my husband uh, was... Uh, believing God and he believed God he pastor he believed God he said okay uh, first of all woman I got to tell you something nobody nobody not from the beginning of time nobody from the beginning of time to this present ever believed God and died in the condition they were in 
Nobody. In other words, they never made the full transformation into faith. And they were standing in faith and God let them die. He said, it just was, I can tell you, woman, miss, it's just totally impossible. Well, he did. He was believing God with all his heart and he just died. He said, ma'am, it's, it's just absolutely impossible. Nobody's ever done it. It's never happened. It just that hasn't never happened. She said, well, I, he said, let me just ask you, maybe help, help you a little bit. Can you, can you remember, can you remember during those, that year or something when he went from different stages of cancer, can you remember just because, see, when you catch people inadvertently, not when they're not at church, church is pretense. <laughs> church, all of us have our Sunday morning, I'm spiritual face on. But can you ever remember him just sitting around in his, his skivvies, you know, his fruit of the looms at the, at the breakfast table? And you just walking by him and he didn't know you were, you, were, you were watching or listening. Can you ever remember just catching him in there in the next room talking to the cancer? What? He said, I, Jesus said, you have to speak and talk to your mountain." You've got to talk to it just like it's a personality, just like it's a personified. Did you ever walk by him and him just hanging out there in the kitchen, sitting at the kitchen table, talking and saying, and like you, nobody was in there, but you just called him saying, I'm talking to you, cancer. You will not kill me. Jesus said, the word said, by his stripes, I am healed. I, I will live and not die. And declare the works of the Lord. Did you ever catch him doing that? No, I never caught him doing that. He said, ma'am, your husband's in heaven. He loved God. He's there. The only thing is, he never was able to make the full transition. Because nobody that ever makes that full transition in faith and goes all the way to believing in something that God has said, nobody ever died to at that condition of a hundredfold. Now take it, that's individually. That's individually. But then you transition and let's, let's leapfrog, let's jump ahead and say, okay, that's teaching somebody to stand against the trial of their life. They're depressed. You know, they want to find a way to escape. You know, they're trying to, they, they, they're so depressed, they're trying to figure out how to do away with themselves. And they just stand against that mountain and I say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I am filled with the peace that passes all understanding. And on and on and on. And you take those scriptures and you pound. And you can't do those on the fly. And you can't do those like, uh, you know, just one or two. You've got, Gary said when, uh, when finances were staying away from him in great abundance, when he was so poor, him and Sue, that it took him... The, the, it took him four hours. He just divorced everything else, put away for, for a season the word, uh, time in the word, or praying in tongues, and just uh, uh, worship for four straight hours. Now, everybody say four hours. <laughs> four hours is a long time when you're doing something like that. Four hours is monotonous. I don't know how many months that he did it, but for four hours a day. For four hours a day, he was, would speak scriptures over his finances for four hours a day. A lot of times people will tell you, I'll do anything for this thing to change. <laughs> I'm so depressed, Pastor, if you tell me what to do, I'll do anything. Okay, I'm all, okay here's your prescription. Okay, I'm writing it out. Okay. You're going to fast one day on, one day off, and one day... Oh, no, wait a minute, Pastor. I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't do that, Pastor. I can't. No, you think you'll do anything to get out of what you're in. But you lie against your own heart because you're not willing to walk the floor four hours and you're not willing to fast every other day. Or you're not willing. When you get ready to really, when it gets sometimes so bad that you say, okay, I'll, I'll throw. He's, see, Satan takes us. Evidently, some of you warriors around here have done enough to get him riled up. 
Now, I know that happened to his, that church, but don't you think that if he could, he'd, he would zero in on us? He'd zero in on us, from, starting from the pastor right on down. If he could take any of us out, he, could, he would. So here's the thing. That's individually the, the example I gave about Norval. Uh, sometimes, and I've had some good, we've had some good people that loved God among us that have died of cancer and those kinds of things. And that's just an example. They were believing and somewhere they were probably 30 or 40, but the corn stalk in them, uh, the cancer outrun the corn stalk. Say it that way. The cancer run up ahead and got ahead of the growth of the corn stalk. That, boy, that's why it's good. Preventative corn stalk growth is a lot better than trying to grow that corn stalk off up when they say you only got six months to live. Because then you got to go through all the cancer treatments and all that stuff, and unless you just decide to stay, then I'm going to go stay home and die or, or, or believe God one way or the other. But growing a corn stalk in the midst of hell is a lot harder than growing it before hell gets there. Okay? But uh, a lot of people, their trial outran their corn stalk. Their corn stalk, maybe to start with, but, the corn, but their, their trial. Their, their trial grew, the, the trial at maturity was six foot four, and their corn stalk was, you know, five foot, and it, 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 the cancer outran their, outran their faith. It outran their place. Well, here's the thing, like, with a guy like that died out in Tulsa, uh, and all of us knew him. Man, I loved him. I knew him for years. Wonderful guy. Just abs 53 years old. Looked fantastic. Looked great. Uh... The bottom line is this, and this is not condescending on me or any of us, because we're all, at least we're the spearhead. At least we're trying to get it done. So the Lord in heaven is, he's in some of those prophecies, please listen to those prophecies, 2000, called Blueprint for 2020. I've asked everybody that believes that they're part of this vision to listen to them at least 30 times. They're on the front page of our website. There's people in here, and I don't know where we are as a group. I don't know if we're 40, 50, 60. I hope we're <laughs> above 50, 60. There's people at different stages. So it's not like that everybody that was praying for him, if there was 100 intercessors, Gary thought there was 100 people probably praying for this man. Here's the bottom line that we have to reconcile. This is the truth, because we just know it. If Jesus walked through the wall, we've had this example. He'd heal everybody in the building. And then he would turn to me and say, Bronk, I love you. You're, I, I, you're wonderful in that sense that you're my son. But why haven't you been able to do this? But here's the deal. Of all the people that were praying for him, nobody, nobody has their corn stalk mature enough. Nobody's corn stalk was mature enough to stop it. If you knew about it, some people didn't know about it, but if you knew about it and you uttered a prayer to heaven, your corn stalk had not grown. Now that's not condescending, it's just recognizing where we're at. Because we're going forward into revival. And if we recognize that the year in front of us is a year to focus like never before. I know these are real rock hard kind of bone serious sermons. But uh, if we laugh when we get here, that's a plus. I, I, I like to be humorous. I like to keep things uh, happy and laughter at times. But that's a plus because what we're coming here for is to be trained. And we've said this before, not being mean, if somebody comes through and says, well, you know, I'd like a church like this. Uh, we'd like programs and boy, we'd like some coffee before church. And we'd like to, I'd say, man, you, you're the greatest, but going down the road. Find there's another church for you someplace. Because right now, until we get, see, here's, let me read this. Let me read this. He gave this to me early. I just entitled it The Red Line. We've heard some things about 
the military in the past year, you know, the past several years, about one president said he was going to draw a red line, and uh, he didn't keep that mess. He didn't keep that commitment. Our red line has been drawn. Immokalee is growing up, and there's generals in here that are growing up. One day, and right now, present tense, I'm saying there's going to be not only me, but there's going to be several of you men and women that when we get a call like that, we won't know exactly who stopped it, but somebody will be able to stop it. Stop it. Your corn stalk will be high enough to stop it. Now, here's the red line. The red line of revival cannot be crossed. In other words, as far as Satan's mind, when we start talking like this, we can feed the poor. I, I guarantee you this. We can feed the poor, knock on doors, have a benevolence ministry, and do all kinds of things, and it will not rile him up like the message of praying and praying in tongues and getting into the Word of God and putting a greasy spot on the wall where you'll camp out and just pray in tongues. And when you mention the word fasting, you're, you're cursing in the spirit realm to him. You've just slapped him upside the head and said, oh, you want to get it on? You want to get it on? You want to see? Let's go. Because that's what he... But here, here's the red line of revival cannot be crossed as far as he's concerned. There is a bulwark of spiritual warfare surrounding the fortress of supernatural signs and wonders. It's not just, please, okay, let's get both sides of it. It's not just that we haven't died enough to the flesh. That's part of it. See, we as Christians, a lot of times, we want to you know, teach one thing and just get a rail on that. And get a, dying to the flesh is part of it. But that's not all of it. The other side of it is that there is a bulwark or a, a, a buildup. It's a bulwark of spiritual warfare, for, warfare surrounding the fortress of supernatural signs and wonders. In other words, stop it. Heart right now, be healed. This fortress belongs to us, the church. We will not concede it, but we will walk in the fullness of it. Now listen to this, because it's a truth. It is a million times easier to prevent, as far as spiritual warfare is concerned, it's a million times easier to prevent a revival than to contain it. In other words, the enemy sees that the only chance he's got in keeping a revival from affecting and bringing forth a great tsunami in the earth around us is to prevent it before it ever happens. Don't let the water get over the dam. Don't let there be those who will begin to really believe that this thing can happen and pursue because with it becomes an atmosphere and with it an atmosphere is conducive and with it an atmosphere is contagious and with it an atmosphere begins to build faith it begins to be hope and it begins to exude an angelic activity as far into a region and as the region grows in strength and faith demonic spirits are demoralized to where that they cannot keep up with the it's our corn stalk goes way past any demonic influence that's the breakthrough it begins to exude past it and begins to pour in the anointing and the glory and the honor and so the precipice right at the beginning right at the very first part he's got to smack you in your mouth and everybody usually just backs off a little if he can't do it with pleasure of life and diverting you then for those who will he'll just punch you right in the mouth and then you say well my god if that's the price i got to pay there's no will there's no way that we could ever go into revival he knows on the other side of the outpouring he's demoralized he's brought low he can't contain it the enemy knows that he cannot afford to allow the outbreak of revival that is why his forces must be focused on prevention Stopping it in its infancy is one million times easier than stopping it in its adulthood. We're going to have an adulthood revival. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He cannot afford for us 
to set up strongholds inside the promised land of revival. His objective is the exact polar opposite of our objective and vision of the world seeing the power of the church. The weak, the powerless, the sin-ridden church in the earth is one of his greatest testimonies that God is not relevant, alive, awesome, and a conquering, coming king. It's not, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to be too sarcastic here. It's Jesus' church. He's the Lord over it. But Satan has really, he's really helped paint it. He, he, he's got an incredible investment in the church. He's helped, he's helped develop a church that is a phantom. It is a phantom from the first church. It's, it's a ghostly phantom of what the power and the strength of the church, first church looks like. And because the church is so sin-ridden, in the essence of the church just sleeps and fornicates just like the world. The world, the church just drinks like the world. The church just does this like the world. The church just, and the world's like, <laughs> we're, we're a mockery. We're a snicker behind the backs of sinners. I actually, if I wasn't inside I, and looking, if I was on the outside looking in, I'd say, what do you got to offer? You're telling me about your affair that you had with her? Just like, I mean, it's, it's no different. We're so di and then the other part of it is we have no, we, ne we have no pizzazz. Our pizzazz is our testimony is power. We prayed, they got healed. We prayed. And then sinners will look at us and say, we're, there's something weird going on. You know, I don't, uh, first of all, you won't do what, you won't drink with me on Saturday night. But when you pray, something happens. Right now, at the church has very little. Now, we're, we're cornstalks of a different field. We're growing in a different field. Our cornstalk is going to, it's going to eventually, if we keep listening, we keep praying, we keep having Sunday nights where... Uh, we're going to confess the word, but mostly pray, find a spot, and we're going to pray for an hour, hour and a half, just pray in tongues, and just stay in that place. Just stay in that place. Corporate prayer, corporate prayer, corporate prayer. We're going to receive this. And you are going to be soldiers in Joel's army. We never got to Joel's army. That's where we're supposed to go today. You are soldiers in Joel's army that will bring in, because wherever your cornstalk is, I can salute all of you and say this, you can't, you can't even be in this church or listen to Gary Carpenter or Jim Martin or any of these. You can't, if you've been listening, you can't be at 20 or 30. You've got to be somewhere. Well, in other words, we're way further along than what our testimony is revealing right now. It's just that we've got to step past the present, dent, present tense strongholds of the miraculous into a place where we are and live like who we are becoming. Hallelujah. So listen, we're not, at, we're not at zero. Anybody that's been around here very long is not at zero. You're not 10, 20, probably even 30 or 40. We're, if you've been doing this and prayer and fasting and you're, you're going to read this and hear this blueprint and stay on this with us, you're probably well over 50, 60, maybe some of you 70, but I'm telling you, we've got to go ahead all the way into this next year. And we've got to lead a force behind us by way of example. And we've got to say, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to pull my part. I'm going to bring my part in spiritual authority and encouragement to people. I'm not, I'm going to, when people talk to me, I'm, it's not going to be that I try to exude it, but they're going to know if my friends are going to know I, I'm fasting. I can't go out this week. I'm fasting. I'm praying. How many times have you listened to the blueprint? Where are you at? Because we're on a journey together. We're going to receive this outpouring together. Hallelujah. Woo. We're not going to walk by some of you at times and say, have you stand up, Lieutenant Ellie. Are you, are, <laughs> are you doing your part? Are you planning on doing your part? Yes, sir. Will you, uh, will, you get, will you have my six? Yes, sir. You know, well, somebody says six. You know what a six is? If you're looking at the clock, keep standing. If you're, if you're looking at a clock and you're facing 12, directly behind you is what you cannot see. You're six. 
military or, or different uh, law enforcement will say, watch your six. Or I got your six. Hallelujah. Look, a gunnery sergeant, <laughs> would you please stand? Gunnery sergeant Kirsten, do you have my six? Are you going to help us bring this revival? Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is our year. This is our year. Keep standing. Hallelujah. I like this. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is a nickname. This is my Ray Skywalker. Stand up, Ray Skywalker. Hallelujah. You got my six? You going to bring it? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. I could just go all the way around the room. I got Miss uh, General Gay. Stand up, General Gay. <laughs> You got my six? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, sir. I know she does. Let's all stand together. Yes. Glory. Father, Amen. kingdom of God, come. Jesus. Will of God be done. Pour out your glory in this house and Jim's church and Tulsa and different houses. Let revival rage in Alabama and Georgia and different places. Let the presence of God go into the different homes, into the ministries all around the world. This is the most exciting generation in history. The one that will see the coming of our Lord and Savior. The one that will see arms and legs grow out. That will see blind eyes healed and restored. We love you, Jesus. We give you all the praise and glory. And this is our solemn commitment to you. We have got your six, Lord. You left this planet, but we have got your back. We will go into revival, and we will fulfill our destiny in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Woo! Man, amen. Give somebody a great big hug. Amen.